Welcome, and in this video course, we are looking at the CyberOps Associate version one course. This course is going to cover the skills and knowledge needed for successfully handling the tasks and duties, responsibilities of an associate level security analyst working at a security operations center. The goal of this video series is to help prepare learners for the Cisco 200-201 certification. That's focusing on understanding the Cisco Cybersecurity Operation Fundamentals course known as CBROPS. Welcome to Module 5, Network Protocols. In this chapter, we're focusing on the network communication process. So we're going to be dealing with the basic operations of data flow. We're going to explain how the protocols enable network operations. And we're going to talk about data encapsulation. So if you're not familiar with the Cisco background, if you're not familiar with the OSI or TCP IP or things like that, it's okay. This module is going to help break down some of those more foreign concepts. So the first section is network communication process. Regardless of the size, networks have to communicate. There are two main ways that this is done. They can have a peer-to-peer, -peer, and that's where everyone on the network is created equal. They all share resources, and there is no type of centralization. There is no type of management. Everyone is equal across the board. Or we have what's called a client server. We have one resource being hosted on a server, and that hosts and responds to requests to that resource. So the big two are again peer-to-peer, -peer, everyone's equal, client server, we have one centralized resource that's managed and governed centrally. It doesn't matter the size of the organization. It's going to be one of these main types of networks. But keep in mind that communication can be as simple as two, two things. Me and my phone, me and my car, me and another individual, or it can be me and the internet, me and 20 people on Zoom. So the growth options are astronomical. Me at home and me interacting with my house, all of those can be different types of networks. If we're dealing with a home network, we typically call these small home networks, and there's typically a small router, a small device that interconnects everything with that local resource. We could have a small office or home office or Soho. And this kind of allows us to have a little bit more in our in our home. Realistically, smart homes are becoming more popular, so I mean, we could have more devices that are connected. And you may even have a centralized device. For example, in my house, I have a centralized printer that's shared with everyone. Well, that's typically more of the Soho office not so, uh, so much as a small home. So it kind of depends. We also have medium businesses, small businesses. They're going to be slightly different than any uh, office or any uh, small office or home office. In a small office, home office, you may have, you know, five PC, a centralized device, where a small office might have 20 computers and multiple shared resources. A small office could also be uh, having a server. It really just depends on the situation. Medium businesses, more resources, more devices, more connectivity. Large networks, even more. Large networks or even uh, geographically uh, wide networks could also be citywide, could be statewide, could be countrywide or nationwide. So our networks can range small to large. And that means that we have to be able to interact with, regardless of what type of network we're dealing with. Client server communication, again, we have that centralized location. I don't know why they did those slides the way that they did. I probably would have talked about the office types first and then peer to peer. That way we could go directly into client server, but it is what it is. Client server does provide a single point, providing everything central on that server. Though, that could also be a single point of failure depending on your business. Because you have one server that runs everything, what happens if that server goes down? And here's an example. 
you'll notice in this example, we don't have one server. We may have three servers or five servers or eight servers. Or realistically, if you're a small business, you probably have one server that does all three tasks. The interesting part is, let's say we do have multiple servers. Well, our infrastructure, the device running the network, you'll notice there's a switch in the middle. What happens if this guy goes down? Again, single point of failure. Anyways, the point of this is not to talk about the single point of failure. The, the point of this was to point out that we could have resources. The email server hosts email. We have a web server that hosts websites. We have a file server that hosts files. And that way you can have different clients that connect to them. This web client could also be checking their email and checking the website. So this client could be both. And depending what he's doing, he may be connecting to more than one server or could be connecting to all three servers. It kind of just depends on what they're trying to accomplish. So let's talk about uh, maybe a typical use example. So a typical network uh, could be like um, users at a campus. You're going to have multiple devices, multiple connections within a resource. Those resources could be located in the same room or maybe somewhere around the world. We don't know. So at school, for example, students are encouraged to use laptops, tablets, other uh, mobile devices for learning aids. You may connect to the school Wi-Fi or the campus Wi-Fi to do uh, schoolwork. You may connect to the school's LMS, learning management system, to log in to do coursework, or maybe you're using Google to do searching. You're going to have to use the school's internet or their ISP, internet service provider, so that you can get connectivity. So it's a combination of what you're doing to get your resource. You do a search on the internet. It's not just you and the internet. You have to go through the school's network. You have to, if you're using a mobile device, for example, you have to go through the school's wireless network. The wireless will go through some form of physical infrastructure. The physical infrastructure has to go through this uh, ISP. The ISP has to send it through their infrastructure to reside on the other end. Maybe it's Google on the other end. The other end has whatever resource you're trying to request. They have to then serve that resource and put it back on their internet provider. Their internet provider routes it back to you, which is sent through all the different interconnecting devices, back through the school's network, back through the school's wireless, back to your device. And we didn't even talk about any of the servers that may be involved as well. So it's not just a straight me and the internet. There's all of the things between me and the internet for me to even have access to the internet. If you're dealing with gaming, same thing. You hop on any type of gaming platform. It's not just you and the game. Well, it's kind of single player and you're doing it, you know, just local than, yeah, that could be. But I mean, if you're doing it multiplayer, you're going to be connecting to a game server at some location. You connect to your ISP. Your ISP will connect through the internet to the game server. The game server will have multiple other people connecting to it. And then from that gaming server, everything is processed and then sent back to the individual gamers who's doing it. So you, who's gaming, you may have local resources like graphic and sound and display that are local but then you also have the internet based resources the game server and the actual interconnectivity of your device so that you can play multiplayer with other people if we're talking medical telemedicine has been growing drastically when you have an x-ray or you do a patient visit or you go to the uh, OBGYN more and more doctors are using telemedicine for medical work or me even just medical con uh, consultation. With the last year's COVID, a lot of people didn't go to the doctor. They had to reinvent how they were doing checkups. So a lot of doctors jumped on telemedicine band uh, bandwagon. You do a Zoom session with your doctor. Your doctor will give you, you know, a exam through Zoom. And through that process, 
you could then he could uh, do whatever he needed. He could schedule the tests that he needed. You'd have to go do the tests, and then all of those test results would then be again uh, posted online for both you and the doctor to go over. If the doctor had to go over them with you, another Zoom session could happen, and then the doctor would actually go through the contents of those test results with you via a Zoom call. It really doesn't matter what industry you're in, all of them have a certain level of communication that's attached to them. The important part here is understanding how we trace the communication through the multiple paths they can take. I connect with my laptop to the wireless, I go to Google, how does it get there? And that's the thing is we have to understand that there's a path that it can take. The role of the cybersecurity analyst is to have that understanding of flow of communication so they can uh, be able to determine where the traffic is coming from, where is it going, and if it's legitimate or not. The traffic from a device to the internet, for example, it can take multiple paths, but we have to be able to break down where is the source coming from, where is the destination, and what are the details of that. So tracing a path between the internet could be all over the place because it can be a combination of copper, fiber optic, wireless, satellite, tier 1, tier 2, tier 3 providers. Tier 3 providers are what most of us connect to. If you have home internet, you're connecting to a tier 3 provider. The tier 3 providers get their internet from tier 2 providers. Tier 2 providers get their internet from a tier 1 provider. Tier 1 providers are like the big guys, Verizon and AT&T. And there's only seven within the U.S. that actually control the internet for just the U.S. Each big country, each major country, has their own tier one network providers. But essentially, the way the internet works is it's this high type of hierarchy model. Each country has interconnecting tier one connections that allow for communication. So when you want to go to Google, you may have to go up your t uh, tier 3 to a tier 2, and your tier 2 may connect to another tier 2 that might be connected to Google. So you may not have to go all the way to the very top, that may be able to just go from one uh, tier 2 to another tier 2. For example, we may, let's say Google's over here. We may go to our tier 3 provider, we want to go to Google, our destination would be looked at, and instead of sending it up, we may go, oh, you know, Google is this way. So we have some, some options. It's just a matter of understanding how we can read our communication so we understand source and destination. And don't worry, we do have a lab tracing out routes through, connect, uh, through web resources. All right, so that took care of the first section. The second section is all about communication protocols. What are the guidelines, what are the rules, procedures of communication? Normally, the protocols are going to be things like delivery options, timing, size, uh, formatting, encoding, encapsulation, things like that. These are the p main pillars that uh, talk about or make up a protocol. The protocol are the, is the guidelines, it's the rules. So these protocols are specific to the type of communication that's going to be occurring. If we connect to the internet, we're using a very specific set of protocols. Uh, the internet uses TCP IP. It used to use a combination of protocols. It used to have like Apple Talk or IPX, but as the internet started growing, we had to have a single standard for communication. And that's where TCP IP took off. So again, the network protocols provide the means for how we communicate. They provide the encoding, the formatting, the timing, options. They provide everything for us to successfully communicate. If we want to use a website, for example, we can use the HTTP protocol hypertext transfer protocol for 
transmitting their web content to us. Well, how does that web content get to us? It's going to travel over a some form of communication platform, TCP or UDP, to get to us. From there, it will be handed out to an IP. That's going to be a layer three, which we'll talk about that a little later. To get to us. So there are layers of communication. It's not just one blob for communication. So here we have an application protocol, multiple application protocols that sit on top of multiple transport protocols. TCP is one, UDP is another. So we have our application that sits on top of our transport protocols. Our transport protocols sit on top of a network protocol. Our network protocols are IP, that could be IPv4 or IPv6. And these network protocols sit on top of a transport, sorry, application, transport, transport, network, network, data link. The internet protocol, the IPs, sit on top of a data link layer. And that's going to be some form of MAC or media access or frame. And that's all going to be different depending on the type of media you're connecting to. The messages typically will be encapsulated. So we have our data, then we put an IP onto it. Well, in reality, this data is transport, and the transport's going to have application data. App data. We kind of just encapsulate it, we, we group it, and then we put an IP on it. The IP address allows us to go outside of our network. So our router will receive our packet. We'll look at the IP source and destination header. Well, we'll look at the header for the source and destination information. The destination will determine which path it takes. So in this example, we may have multiple paths. The routers will share which paths are down. And if the path between one location and another, maybe it doesn't go this way, maybe it goes this way. We don't know. The routers will actually determine the best path to go from source to destination. That's the purpose of routing. We also have the ability to share information. So if a path goes down, like this path is down, the routers should be able to talk to one another and say, oh, this path is down, let's recalculate how we'd be sending data. So that talks about a lot of the communication flow. What happens if I'm a, a user and I have two websites open? I do two requests instead of one. Well, each request is going to be different. There are things called sessions, and each session, each request is going to be different, and each session, each request is going to be based off a different session. And we have session management that allows us to manage the different sessions between our multiple tabs, our multiple requests. I go to Google and I go to Bank of America. Each one of those are separate sessions and they need to be managed separately. That way the return information will be different. If I Google something, I don't want to get my login for Bank of America. I want to get my Google request returned to my Google tab. On my tab that has Bank of America, I want my Bank of America request to be coming in on that tab and not some other random tab, if that makes sense. So how does the devices, how do the routers know how to form data? Well, it's based off of this OSI model. Uh, OSI is just a way to conceptually break down the communication process. So we said earlier, we have application data. 
So that's going to be like your HTTP or your DNS. And they sit on top of some type of transport layer. That's going to be either TCP or UDP. And then we have our internet layer. That's our network layer. Those are going to be the networking protocols, typically IP-based protocols. And then on top of there, we have our network access layer, which is really funny because in reality, this is the network layer. This is the name of the layer. And this would be more of our data link layer. It really just depends. So this structure is all together combined is the TCP IP layers. <clears throat> The OSI is the same general breakdown of the different layers. It's just more of a application is broken down into three layers. That's one layer, this is one layer, and this is two layers. So there are slightly differences between the different types of reference models we use to look at this. And again, a lot of the big portion with TCP is TCP is the protocol suite it's the, the family of all the protocols. And this suite has two main things. There's open standards, meaning publicly available. And then there's standard-based protocols. That means they're endorsed by certain uh, industry giants that kind of approve the structure. So this provides a brief overview of how the communication occurs. We have application data. We have some type of transport data. What each of these layers do in depth is courses load of material. But I will be posting other videos kind of examining them a little bit more in depth. Application layer may have certain things like DNS or DHCP. DNS is domain name systems. That's the core service that translate domain names, google.com, into an IP address. We know domain names. The computer knows IP addresses. So the, Google, the computer has zero idea of where Google is. But we can query a DNS server, and that holds the library of this is Google, this is Google's IP. That way, when we say where is Google, DNS will give us back an IP address. That way, we can take that IP address and our computer knows, oh, this is the destination, go to this location. How do we get addresses? Addresses are done through DHCP or Dynamic Host Control Protocol. And we have variations for IPv4 or IPv6. IPv6 uses a stateful and stateless options. And again, that's way more in depth than what we need to go. Just we're trying to get a basic understanding of what some of these services are. So. If you know, uh, need to understand how a device will get an IP address, it's done through DHCP typically. If you are wondering how an IPv6 address is assigned, it's one of two ways, stateful with DHCP or stateless with Slack. Slack is a method of addressing method to obtain an address. We have other things like email, SNMTP, this allows us to send an email. If we're talking how to receive an email, it's going to be POP or IMAP. So SMTP is for sending. These two are for receiving. If you want to block people from sending email, you block SMTP. If you want to block people from receiving email, you have to block both POP and IMAP. And even then, it's not guaranteed that's the way outside we need to go. Anyways, what happens if we want to transfer data files? Well, if it's trivial or small, we have small or trivial file transfer protocol, TFTP. If we're dealing with just regular size content, it's FTP. But FTP, everything is plain text, not secure whatsoever. So we have a secure file transfer protocol or secure copy protocol and that's gonna be more secured and encrypted. So FTP is for data transfer, not encrypted. Secure FTP is for encrypted file transfers, and trivial FTP is for small file transfers. If we're looking at sending web content, 
we have two main web protocols, HTTP and HTTPS. HTTP is plain text. HTTPS is HTTP secure or HTTP over SSL. It basically encrypts the HTTP. Ah, there are other things out there. We have some other types of requests. We have what's called, called an API. So when you ask a website for certain resources, the website might have to query something on the back end. Well, it does it through these APIs. And we also have what's called a REST, or Representational State Transfer. This allows us to basically define the service that will use the application program interface and HTTP requests to create web application content. So if we need to request certain content, once we hit the web server, we may end up with a REST request so that we could retain certain information. Our protocol suite, we said, had transport layers, TCP and UDP. We need to talk about those a little more in depth. So the two main types of transportation protocols are going to be broken up into one of two categories, connection-oriented or connectionless oriented Connection-oriented, TCP, is going to establish a connection between source and destination. And it's going to guarantee delivery. There's going to be mechanisms uh, involved with this to ensure reliable transportation of data. If we chunk data and the destination only receives four out of six things, well, the other two things that never showed up will be reset because there's part of the mechanism for TCP is about guaranteed delivery. With connection list oriented UDP, it basically will send it, and if you get it, great. If you don't, oh well. Best effort, but there's a lot less overhead. There is no having to worry about every single packet, did it get delivered? So let's talk about use case. Where are you going to see these? Well. If you're dealing with real-time traffic, you're going to notice it's always going to be UDP. That overhead might cause delay. That overhead might cause choppiness. So voice, video, streaming, those are all going to be part of UDP. If you're talking about website traffic or logging into a secure portal, those are going to be TCP because the delivery needs to be guaranteed. They want to make sure the delivery component is there. So this sits on top of the network layer. This is going to be dealing specifically, I know I said network layer, so I keep referencing it back to the OSI model because that's the typical model. It could also be known as the internet layer if you're talking the TCP layers. But even then, depending on the model you're looking at, they change the names. Anyways, the important part is the transport protocols, TCP or UDP, sit on top of our internet or network protocols. That's going to be things like IPv4 or IPv6. IPv4 is our logical addressing, which what most of the US uses now. It's a 32-bit address. And it's going to be the, uh, denoted like 8.8.8.8 or some number dot some number dot some number dot some number. Four numbers separated by three dots. This is dotted decimal notation. Well, these numbers are actually groups of eight bits. And eight bits plus eight bits plus eight bits plus eight bits, that is how we get the 32 bit address space. With IPv6, that's going to be more hexadecimal, so like FE80 colon colon 1, for example. That's going to be a pretty common IPv6 uh, denote, uh, way to denote addresses, but IPv6 uses 128 bit addresses. So IPv4 dotted decimal, decimal. IPv6 is hexadecimal. We still have our things like messaging protocols. That's going to be like ICMP or ping. I, uh, ping is an ICMP echo request message. We have our routing protocols, OSPF, EIGRP, RIP, BGP, 
and so forth. Our routing protocols are the protocols that are used about how um, the routers will share information between one another. All right, so that takes us to our bottom layer, the network access layer or the data link layer. That's going to actually sit on top of where the wires, the actual media, is being connected. So there's two main types of data link protocols, wired and wireless. The different wires are going to be different methods, but for most times it's going to be using Ethernet. And that's going to define the wiring standards, the signaling standards, and all of that dealing with the communication for network access. For our wireless, it's going to use a wireless local area network uh, rules, and they're going to, again, define the rules for signaling and radio frequencies and things like that. There's also a few other things that happen at this layer. We have address resolution protocols, ARP, and they basically provide the address mapping between our hardware addresses, MAC addresses, and our logical addresses, or IP addresses. So ARP is actually going to help us connect between the two different layers, between the network access layer and the internet layer, or between the data link layer and the network layer. So all of this combined basically makes up a lot of the, the structure for our communication. But we also have to talk about how the message is formatted. How is it sent? How is it grouped? How is it organized? The way that it's grouped and organized, that's the encapsulation. How is it formatted? That's going to be things like the uh, source and destination and the order that it's going to go in. So let's give an analogy. If we have a letter, for example. We know how the letter should look. We know this, the middle part is the destination. We know the top left is the source. We know we have to do postage. And then we have a letter inside the envelope. So this is the application data. This is what we're trying to, to do or send. And then this is encapsulated or put inside the envelope. The envelope will actually have the directly the, the actual listed components that it needs to get from the source, the sender, to the destination. We have the same thing within our IP uh, addressing or data communication. If we have a data signal going somewhere, we will have a header. It will give us the version. It will give us like uh, labels. It will give us our source address and our destination address and so forth. So this is a generic header that provides the rules for how to send data between myself and my destination, between one device and another. So what are the rules? Well, the nice thing is within our rules, we have to actually explain what are we trying to communicate, how are we going to communicate, how large, or how much data can we send at once, or do we have to limit it? Do I, can I send, you know, five paragraphs of information, and, and are you going to receive it and understand it? Or do I have to break it up? Do I have to limit how much data I'm sending to you? So there is a message size. How much can I send to you before I allow you to respond, or how much do I have to send to you before you can comprehend what I'm trying to say? In networking terms, we do the same thing. We go to Google and we want to download a large file. It doesn't come as a single piece of data. It comes in multiple pieces of data, multiple packets over our internet. Whether it's wireless or wired, it doesn't matter. It's going to chunk the data up into something that's more manageable for them to manage. And then again, if it's TCP, as you send each chunk of data, it has to guarantee delivery for each chunk. If it's UDP, it won't. So the next thing is timing. How fast can we talk? How fast can we transmit things? And 
part of timing is also going to be things like response. If I give you a second to respond, is that enough time? So we have to talk about flow control, and that's going to be how much I send and at what speed. And then I have to talk about when I ask a question, how long do I wait for an actual response? Last is access method. How can we make sure that someone can send the message? When you get it, do I get a response? Is the response because the message never sent to you? Or is the response never being able to be sent back to me? So access method is going to be important. Typically communication happens one of three major ways. If we're talking IPv4, it will happen to be a unicast, that's a one-to-one. -one. I communicate with one device. Or it could be a multicast, that's going to be I connect to multiple devices and send data to multiple devices. Or do I send data to everyone? If I want to send a message to a printer, for example, that's going to be an example of unicast. I send one message to the printer, the printer should be able to get my unicast message and respond correctly. If I don't know where the printer is, I may ask everyone on the network, hey, where's the printer? That'd be an example of a broadcast. So what are some of the benefits of using this hierarchy model? Well, it's about being able to quickly reference and understand what's happening in the network. The OSI, like I said before, when we compare it to the TCP IP model, we have three layers versus one. We have our transport, which is the same. We have our network layer, which correlates to the internet layer. We have our data link and our physical layer, and that correlates to the network access layer. They pretty much do the exact same thing, it's just more about how we reference this. And sometimes TCP IP model can be a, a combination of four layers, five layers, and sometimes the names can be slightly uh, different as well. And again, the reference models are really just used so that we can reference what's happening on the network. So let's talk about the OSI reference model a little bit more in depth. Again, it describes the interaction between each layer and what's happening so that we can understand what's occurring. Application builds with the protocol, with process to process. This is the layer that we users interact with. Presentation provides the representation of the data and the way that the application layer will use it. Typically, the layers are, they only interact with the layers above and below it. So layer one only interacts with layer one and layer two. Layer two interacts with layer one and layer three. Layer three interacts with layer two and layer four and so forth. Sessions provide the presentation layer to organize the, the the dialogue and manage the data exchange. Transport defines the segmentation and transferring as well as reassemble of the data. Network provides end-to-end -end communication function and how the logical component is going to get source to the destination. Data link is going to be the method for exchanging data frames over a media. And physical is going to be the actual putting the uh, message on the, the wire whether it be wireless, wired, fiber optic, copper, the physical portion is gonna be the actual sending of the signal. And again, when we look at TCP IP model, application, transport, internet, access, they just combine the same OSI reference models and combine them. Our last major thing is about data encapsulation. It's about being able to take a message and segment them. That way it's not one giant message, it could be multiple small messages. And each small message has to be able to be encapsulated and sent, and as it's sent, it may actually use different paths. So each uh, time we send a signal, we're actually going to do a header on each single packet. When we segment, we increase the speed because we can send m several small chunks of data faster than we can one giant chunk of data. It also increases efficiency when we do this. Each
packet we send should actually be tagged with a sequence number. That way the destination knows how to reassemble it. TCP is responsible for sequencing the individual segments. UDP doesn't sequence. UDP, you get them in whatever order you get them in and you just deal with it. So how do we actually reference what happens at each layer? Well, we do this based off of what's known as a protocol data unit. And again, this is what we call the data at a specific layer. Sometimes we may say like a UDP PDU, it's called a datagram, where IP packets are sometimes referred to as IP datagrams. So I mean, sometimes the language is slightly askew, but for the most part, we're gonna kinda define what we're gonna be using. All right, application layer data. So layers seven, six, and five are all called data. Layer four, the transport layer, is either gonna be a, a TCP segment or a UDP datagram. Realistically, if you ever get this as a question, normally segment is what the general term is even though segments typically denote TCP and datagram represents our UDP. Our layer three, our network layer, we call those packets. Our data link layer, we call those frames. And frames are gonna be media dependent. If it's fiber optic, it'll be a fiber optic frame. If it's wireless, it'll be a wireless frame. If it's ethernet, it'll be an ethernet frame. If it's MPLS, it'll be an MPLS frame. And lastly, the physical layer, the bottom layer, we call those bits. Because again, that's gonna be how we transmit data, whether it's wireless, wired, electrical, or light, it's all pretty much the same. And again, TCP is segment, UDP is datagram. I've never been asked datagram for UDP, but the goal here is to try to get the terms correct, so. All right, so what about the three types of addresses? We have our MAC addresses or physical addresses. And that's at layer two. That's also typically what happens for local communication. They use the physical address. For internet or multiple network addresses, we use a network host address or a IP address, also known as a logical address. And then we have a protocol address or a port number. And typically, every communication is gonna have all three of these. You go to Google, you're actually gonna have Google's IP address. You're also gonna be sending it on a port specific that Google's gonna be listening on. If you send data to Google on port 443, you're essentially saying you're using HTTPS. So here's a good example of our encapsulation. So here we have our application data. We tack on our transport, whether it's TCP or UDP, and we call this entire thing a segment. Then we tack on the IP portion. Now we call this entire thing a packet. And then we put on our frame header. Now there's also at the frame, there's a frame footer, and we call this entire thing the frame. We take this frame, we put it into binary, we call those bits. At the other end, they actually, they take off each layer as it goes up the model. That way you can see the ethernet frame, or you can see the ethernet header. That will expose the IP or logical header. Then you can see the segment or datagram header, then you can see the actual user data. Don't worry, we do have a lab kind of covering uh, what this looks like on the wire in Wireshark. So that's all I had for this chapter. We learned a lot of material. We looked at network sizes, we looked at ISP tiers, we looked at protocols, we looked at what types of protocols there are, models for protocols, 
reference from uh, models. We looked at the protocol breakdown. We looked at PDUs. And we looked at the encapsulation and encoding method. So that is all I had for this material. If you have any questions or concerns, please, please feel free to reach out. Thank you, and I look forward to working with you in later videos. If you have any questions or anything, please feel free to reach out. Again, with this material, being able to ask questions and discuss some of the topics in the lecture help build long-term retention, so do not be afraid to, to communicate with this topic. Again, I'm here if you need anything. Thank you.